want to welcome you. Good morning, I'm Jeffco Commissioner Leslie Dahlkemper. We want to thank you for taking time out of a beautiful Colorado Saturday morning to be with us to learn more about how we can work together to reduce wildfire risk right here in Jefferson County. We are uh, sitting or standing, depending on, on what you're doing this morning, um, in our auditorium, in the, the highest risk area in Colorado. So reducing that risk is critical for all of us. We're going to talk a lot this morning about each role that we play, each of our roles moving forward as well. Jefferson County ranks number one for potential loss of property due to extreme wildfire threat. The other challenge that we face, as many of you know who live in the foothills, is the increased interest in living in this beautiful community. We continue to see growth, development, and population increases in what we call the wildland urban interface. In response, we're tackling this on multiple levels, county, state, and even federal. We're looking at improving forest health. We're also looking at making homes more resilient to wildfire. And we're addressing planning and zoning issues that affect development. We've also doubled slash collection efforts, and you have responded. You've seen the highest numbers ever just in our last uh, slash collection efforts as well. The other thing that I think, if there's one thing that I hope you'll take away from our conversation today, many of you already are very aware of this, given the work that you do in our community, is that there's no one strategy to reduce wildfire risk. It requires a comprehensive strategic approach that involves each and every one of us. We'll talk more about all of those topics in just a moment. But before we go any further, I want to take a moment to introduce uh, our co-host for today's town hall. This town hall is uh, sponsored by your elected officials in this area, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce you first to Senator Lisa Cutter. Our firefighters and our first responders who are here with us today. We have uh, chiefs, we have leaders in mitigation. Can I ask, and you may already be standing, but may I ask all of you to please stand? All of it, our sheriff's office, anyone who is a first responder, so we can We are incredibly grateful for your tireless efforts to keep our community safe. We uh, know how difficult this work is, and we're so grateful for all you do. We just saw an example of the hog back fire and the incredible work that was done by, I believe, more than 20 agencies working on that fire. I also want to take a moment to recognize Sheriff Red Yardell. Sheriff Red <laughs> for being here. Any, any quick words or would you like us to come back to you after the panel? What's best for you? I can just yes, please, come on forward. <laughs> Two more Hi, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you so much for being here. Um, as the newly elected sheriff, we're hitting our 90-day mark, but I do want to introduce a couple people. My other sheriff and former deputy director of emergency management, Scott Eddy, right over the light. So there are people inside the sheriff's office that we will be uh, working very closely with the community, with the commissioners, um, open space, everybody that's up here. And so I wanted to make sure that you were able to put a face with a name. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you so much. Those are experts in the room, and uh, we will be sure to introduce them after our panel conversation because they're going to share with us a few great words. <laughs> Uh, about what's happening at the federal level, and we also know evacuation is a big issue for many. So we'll also hear from Hal Reeve and from Under Sheriff uh, Eddie, as well as Sheriff uh, Marinelli, as they'd like to address that issue. The other thing we know is that May is Wildfire Preparedness Month, but we thought we'd get a head start on it. We don't have a town hall in May, which is why we thought we'd start a little bit early. 
I also want to acknowledge Chief Ouija and the Evergreen Fire uh, Rescue Department for hosting this morning's town hall. We deeply appreciate our partnership with Evergreen Fire and all of our fire districts across Jefferson County. And thanks to many of you who are here today as well. Chief, is there anything you'd like to share? A couple of words in terms of the work that you're doing. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for hosting this event. Obviously, very popular. Uh, I'd be amiss if I, because we're pretty much over capacity, exit. Partners will be happy with you. A couple things with Evergreen Fire. This is our 75th anniversary this year, founded in 1948. So we have a lot of events happening, recognizing a lot of our retirees. Uh, we started working on a master plan. Uh, we're about to sign a contract Monday with a group that we selected. So we're excited to get that done. That'll be a 10 year look at um, our demographics, our growth, our fire stations, our responses, uh, pretty much everything. So uh, we're excited to get that going. As far as wildfire awareness month, uh, which is in May, there's a lot going on. All our firefighters are getting recertified right now. Uh, for wildfire season, um, we have, we're going to be hosting a multi-agency training in May, uh, so all of our responding districts will be coming in. Uh, these trainings are invaluable. We're us all working together, and that's how it happens when these fires kick off. So uh, we have to practice as we play. Um, and lastly, uh, we're staffing up for our wildland season. We're going to have 10 seasonals that we're bringing on board. We have uh, four full-time people. We have two people that will be out doing home assessments. We got our chipping crew starting up. Uh, so a lot of activity from the fire department uh, coming to you this summer. Thank you. I to ask us one more time. If you have an open seat next to you, would you please raise your hand high? And we encourage those of you who may be standing, if you'd like a seat, please grab a seat. Again, if you can hold your hand up really high, let us know where there are seats next to you. We've got some down in front and right here in the middle, and please make yourself comfortable. Well, we have uh, an incredible panel for you this morning. Uh, today, we have experts in protecting your home from wildfires, forest health, development and growth, a huge issue, as well as homeowners insurance. And that's a hot topic, as we know, for those of you who live in uh, high-risk areas like Evergreen, Conifer, Pine, Buffalo Creek, and the surrounding areas. So let me take a moment first to introduce you to our panelists. We have Jess Moore, who is the Wildland Project Coordinator for Evergreen Fire Rescue. <laughs> we also have Tom Hobby, Director of Jetco Parks and Conservation. Abel Montoya is the Director of Jetco Development and Transportation. <laughs> and we have Executive Director of the Rocky Mountain Insurance Information, uh, Carol Walker, is with us as well. <laughs> time to acknowledge that and give them a huge thanks for also taking time this Saturday to be here. So, Jess, we're going to start with you. And one of the things we know is that there's no solution to addressing or reducing wildfire risk. We've talked about that a moment ago. And then it really is about a much more comprehensive approach. Lots of different layers to this work and lots of different individuals involved as well. So talk to us. You, you talk about the three-legged stool. What does that mean? How does that relate to this work? What I always explain with a three-legged stool approach to saving our communities and working within our communities involves the three legs of the stool that include creating fuel rig halos around our communities and our, our homes, as well as working our home hardening and our due diligence and doing our own defensible space. We have to have all three legs of that stool in place to better protect and serve our community in the event of a wildfire. Unfortunately, like you said, there is no silver bullet. It is not a single approach to any of this. We absolutely have to work together, both with our open space partners, as well as with our homeowners, to establish that three-legged stool and make sure that we are doing the most that we can to reduce the risk on our communities. Thank you very much. I know you've been very engaged in that work, working with homeowners and other community partners. 
Tell us a little bit more about the advice that you give to homeowners to help them protect their homes from wildfire risk. Just hardening homes, defensible space. How do, how do those strategies make a difference? The way that we approach it, and we've been very fortunate this year to receive a significant grant from Colorado State Forest Service so that I could double my efforts with mitigation specialists coming out into the community to do defensible space inspections. Now, as those uh, mitigation specialists are coming out into the community, we discuss the home hardening portion as well as the defensible space portion of what homeowners need to be doing and can be doing on their own properties, their due diligence. And what we really like to approach it is to make it a user-friendly, achievable goal for homeowners. We don't want to overwhelm homeowners, but we want to give you the tools and the information to know that any little bit of what you can do is going to start you in that right direction for reducing your risk. We have got a 30-plus you know, year problem that has been building over 100-plus years with suppression of fire in our neighborhoods. And the reality is, is that we built our homes in an environment that was designed to burn. So what we have to do is our due diligence around our properties, our structures, and our homes so that we can survive the potential of a wildfire moving into our neighborhoods. Jess, can you also talk a little bit more about the services and programs that our area fire departments collaborate on together to, to do this work and to help keep the community safe? So within Evergreen Fire and Rescue, um, what we do in particular is we do offer defensible space, free defensible space inspections. We are um, going to be implementing into that toolbox of opportunities for homeowners a wildfire prepared home assessment as well. And then we also offer our chipping services, and all of that can be found on our website. In addition, we work with all of our adjoining agencies, uh, both fire districts as well as Jefferson Con Conservation District, Jefferson County Open Space, Denver Mountain Parks. We work with all of our partnership agencies to help on things that are a little bit more outside of our purview, that, whether that be public space, open land, or a larger area uh, acreage that is a little bit more than what just our can handle doing work with. And so we work together in a partnership organization because we want to create that continuity across the foothills. Great, thank you so much. We're going to move next to uh, Tom Hobie. We're, this is almost like a lightning round panel. We were talking about this earlier because we want to make sure that we get to your questions. And also, uh, if our panelists are able to stay for a little bit after our town hall, uh, as well as our elected officials to answer any additional questions you may have, or we'll make sure that we have everyone's contact information before you leave, too. Um, Tom, uh, Tom, of course, is the director of Jeffco Parks and Conservation. We heard Jess talk about the importance of forest health and uh, fires that also threaten critical watersheds as well as habitat. So as, as we know, it's much more about fire. It's about the impact that a fire has on our, on our environment, on our community. Can you talk first a little bit about the role that Jeffco Open Space plays in terms of promoting forest health, including your work on reducing wildfire risk? Yes, uh, thanks, Commissioner. Can you hear it in the back? You might have no, there, there, there you go. There we go. Uh, thanks, Commissioner, uh, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is a similar turnout to what we saw um, last fall when uh, the Conifer Council hosted a wildfire symposium. And it's terrific uh, to see the <coughs> of interest that we have in the community. It is definitely, there we go. That's better. It is definitely uh, a team effort, as, as Jess mentioned. And I want to just touch on um, Jeffco Parks and Conservation a little bit, uh, which includes Jefferson County Open Space. It also includes the fairgrounds, which is an important facility um, for livestock um, refuge when, uh, when we have an event, and that is under our purview at Parks and Conservation. Uh, we also uh, have Colorado State University Extension. Uh, they do a significant amount of research-based work uh, both on, on forest health, uh, fire mitigation, on public lands and fire properties. Uh, that is where the state forest service is housed. Uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, we have a, a group called Land Stewardship Resources, and that group runs our SLASH program that hopefully many of you have taken advantage of and continue to do so around the county. And also uh, something that we call Jeff Wildfire Save, something we started 
a little over a year ago, and so far we've uh, collectively with our internal and external partners brought in about $9.2 million in grant funding and matching funds for, for wildfire efforts. So, uh, specifically at Jefferson County Open Space, uh, a couple of things. We, we have an important role in, show, in demonstrating uh, how forest health can be beneficial to communities. Uh, we like to say healthy forests are good neighbors. And healthy forests uh, are not something that we have. We have overgrown forests uh, from fighting wildfires over the last 100 to 150 years. Um, lots of photographs and demonstrations that can show that. Um, the first step that we've taken at Jeff Open Space is to make sure we have a terrific, knowledgeable, experienced staff uh, that can do wildfire prescriptions in partnership with other experts, fire districts, the Ember Alliance, the State Forest Service, and more. Uh, secondly, we've developed our forest health plan, and that forest health plan actually has been beneficial countywide in mapping all of the high, highest risk areas and so on uh, in the county. And we've taken a strategic approach to, to look at those in priority, tackling the highest risk areas first, and in this case, in, in, in uh, Evergreen area, that would be Elk Meadow, and uh, Alden for Three Sisters Park. So you see some, some activity at, at Elk Meadow, you will be seeing a significant more amount of activity uh, at Alden for Three Sisters. So I'll leave it at that for now. That's perfect. You know, I'm going to jump right to the concerns that we've heard from some members of our community, some of them are with us uh, here today, and we appreciate everyone's involvement in this conversation. And that is, is Jefferson County clear-cutting for us are we targeting old growth trees? Can you talk to us about how Open Space, working with our partners, addresses which trees you target, and then also there are concerns about the canopy of trees. And I, I don't know if you could also talk about the percentage of canopy forests versus the targeted strategic mitigation component. I think I packed in three questions in that one, so. <laughs> uh, I'll give it a shot. Thank okay. you. First off, uh, the, the answer is no to both of those uh, questions. Um, we're not clear cutting and we're not cutting down old growth. Um, old growth is defined as trees that are uh, well over 200 years old. Um, we, have, we have removed some trees that are in the 125 year range, but that is not classified as an old growth forest. Um, secondly, um, you will see when, when fire mitigation occurs, when forest health activities occurs, whether it's in your yard or in one of our parks, there's a stark difference. Uh, and that is generally a good thing. It's a good thing for the health and vigor of those trees for, because they could, they're not competing for the nutrients and moisture when there's a dense forest. So you, have, you leave behind trees that have a better health and vigor. You also leave behind less fuel so those fires don't burn as hot, which is, which is the devastating effect of, of wildfires. And as Jess mentioned, we're, while we live in the West, wildfire is going to happen. The idea here is to not have those be devastating wildfires, both to the natural environment and the built environment in which we live. Um, so in terms of the uh, third question, you may need to <laughs> well, it, it, the other piece too, I think, is uh, there's there's some concern about when we when we do mitigation within our forests that that exposes the, the forest floor to, to more heat. And I'm wondering if you could share more about what the percentages look like roughly in terms of our, our open space in Jefferson County. Uh, and, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, it's an important <laughs> question. And, and, uh, so, so some of some of the forests that you see, even at Alpeno Park, um, you'll have 200 or more trees to the acre, um, and ideally, we'd like to see that in the 40 to 50 trees per acre. So you begin to get a sense of how dramatic that difference is. In some of the areas we treated recently, because they're so close to the built environment schools, um, nursing homes, hospice care facilities, etc. We're down around the 20 trees per acre um, uh, 
level. And what that does when we when we uh, remove those trees, it allows vegetation to come up in those areas that creates that healthy forest environment. We also are leaving behind some material to to add to the nutrients in the soil, control erosion and the like. So yes, it will it will increase the heat of the forest floor. That will benefit some other plant species. Great, thanks so much, Tom. So we've heard about how we as homeowners can protect our homes through defensible space, home parking, some of the great services and programs that are offered by our fire rescue departments. We've talked a little bit more about mitigation, thinning our forests, why that matters in terms of battling wildfire risk and uh, preparing. Next, we're going to shift to another topic that I know is on many of our minds, and that is growth and development in the wildland urban interface. We know that uh, the WUI is where we are right now, it's where development and forested areas meet, wildfire threat is high, and as population and growth continue, it is certainly an issue that we have to look at. In terms of using every single planning and zoning tool we have in our toolbox and updating plans that deal with wildfire, that focus on evacuation, transportation, mitigation, and more. And in fact, how many commissioners have approved new regs to harden homes, increase defensible space, encourage fire-resistant vegetation around homes, and in fact, thanks to these efforts, we've already seen a doubling in defensible space around homes where permits have been pulled for an extension or an expansion of that particular home and new development as well. We've been working closely with Senator Cutter on supporting the minimum wooey cohort. We have the battle scars to show in that conversation. Uh, but Senator Cutter has been extraordinary in terms of her work to bring diverse stakeholders together to come up with uh, some win-win solutions. And that was a recommendation put forward by the Colorado Fire Commission I'm one of two county commissioners that serves on that commission, and also chair of Delco Wildfire Commission as well, which helps with our, our uh, countywide strategies. We're going to learn next about that $9.2 million in funding that you heard Tom mention just a moment ago. Those are resources to further all of those efforts that I just mentioned. And we recently approved a consulting contract to launch a major project that in part reflects several of the recommendations that were made by our wildfire task force, now our commission. I want to take a moment and ask all the members of our wildfire commission and our task force to please stand so we can recognize you for your work as well. I know Allie needs to leave us. Allie, are you still with us with ASPCA? Terrific. Uh, you heard Tom talk about animal evacuation, and that is a, a big issue, large animal, small animal. Um, Alan was kind enough to stop by this morning, and she brought some additional materials, which are on the table in the back, if you are um, concerned in, about your own animals and want more strategies and tips. Allie is a great resource for that. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. All right, next we're going to move to Abel, Jeff is uh, Director of Development and Transportation. And then let's start first with this huge initiative that we're working on. Can you unpack it for us a little bit? Tell us about the plans and, and why is this work significant in addressing wildfire? Yes, thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, everyone. I have a couple quick questions first. By show of hands, how many folks have submitted a building permit or land use case in the last five years or so? Or so? Raise your hand. Okay. How many folks have participated in community meetings or feedback sessions for either updating our regulations or updating our master plan. Okay. So, so about a third of folks have participated in some capacity, it looks like, with Jefferson County. And so today I want to share with you a, a big, exciting project that we're going to undertake here very shortly. In fact, we hope to have community meetings as early as next month. Um, and so stay tuned for more information about that. Uh, but our plans and regulations update is a combination of a myriad of plans that we have in the county that need to be updated as they haven't been looked at for updates in a holistic manner for at least a decade. And as we know, there's a lot that's changed since then. So we'll be looking at our master plan or comprehensive plan to update that. That really is the vision and spirit of what Jeffco is. That will set the tone in regards to expectations in, in, in regard to what is developed 
in our community, and in some cases, that may be next door to you. So your participation is going to be really important. We're also going to be updating our transportation master plan. And as you know, uh, our demographics have shifted quite a bit over the last decade or more. We have more and more people moving to our community. We have an aging community, as well as some of our schools uh, have to close because we don't have high enrollment anymore. So we're going to examine what those transportation patterns and networks look like, uh, not only in our flatlands, but also our mountain community. So we're going to be looking at an evacuation annex, which is helping us understand where uh, our important corridors are for evacuations. And as you know, emergencies can happen anywhere. So there's not always just one exit, just like this room. There's four different exits. So those are the types of things we'll be examining. Uh, but we need your feedback and your help. And leading up that effort is how our emergency management office from the sheriff's office. So we're excited to continue that partnership with him, as well as our consultants to help us update our transportation master plan. We'll also be looking at the community wildfire protection plans. Now each fire district has their own, and the county also has their own. And so we're going to be looking at all those different plans, trying to make sure that they're aligned with one another, to make sure we have the most recent up-to-date information so that we know where to take action in regard to priorities. So again, your part participation is going to be very helpful in those regards. And then lastly, we're going to be updating our regulations. So once we have all this policy in place, we understand uh, how we've grown and what we want to be and then in the next 20 years or so, we want to make sure we have supportive regulations, whether those are regulations for what our roads look like in regard to those evacuation routes or what additional land use regulations for new subdivisions or new building permits might look like to keep us safe. That's great, Abella. Thank you. I think you actually covered uh, answers to all of these questions, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's so important to underscore how critical your input is in this effort. And as Abella mentioned, you can go to jeffco.us, specifically our planning and zoning page. And I don't know if the information has been posted yet, but it should be soon. Um, this next week. Next week, you'll find all of the information that Abella shared and also more about those community meetings and how you can weigh in. One really quick footnote, on April 18th at Upper High School from 5.30 to 7.30, our transportation department will be talking about a related transportation issue, and that's the work that may be causing some of you a little bit of extra grief or a little bit of extra wait time, but we're working very hard on that issue county uh, regarding Highway 73 and some of the important improvements that are happening that ultimately will make things a lot better. Can you that information again? Sure, you bet. On April 18th at Evergreen High School, Jefferson County Transportation will hold an open house from 5.30 to 7.30, April 18th, to talk about the road improvements along Highway 73 and in, in, in that general area. Thank you. And again, Jennifer, we have U.S. Planning and Zoning for more about the initiative that you heard Bell talk about. All right, next we go to Carol Walker. And Carol, we're so excited to have you with us this morning. Thanks for coming. Carol's the Executive Director of Rocky Mountain Insurance Information. And certainly one issue that I hear about from uh, our constituents is I live in the wildland urban interface, I'm doing the right things, defensible space and more. I am very concerned about the future of my homeowner's insurance living in such a high-risk area. And we're excited to have Carol here to talk about, first, your best advice to homeowners who live in the movie to ensure they don't lose their insurance. What can they do to protect their homes? Thank you, Leslie. And, uh, Thank you to Leslie. I serve on the fire commission with her, and um, you have a fantastic representative in your county commission. So, uh, Leslie, kudos to you. Um, as Leslie said, we're very aware of the insurance industry. My job for the Rocky Mountain Insurance Association, um, I represent insurance companies in Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. And um, we know you're concerned about getting and keeping affordable insurance, especially in places that are so high risk, like Jefferson County. Unfortunately, the reality is, is insurance is also responding to market conditions. And in my 25 years of my job, these are the worst market conditions, not just from escalating catastrophe risk. Colorado is ranked second in the nation for payroll insurance claims, third for wildfire risk. And at the same time, we're up against it, not just the, the increased escalation of claims, but the cost to pay those claims. Um, you add COVID supply chain to that. 
caused a lumber to dry off. Um, we're living in bigger, more expensive homes to rebuild. And then we have labor shortages. So uh, those contractor labor shortages are also impacting what insurance companies are paying out in climate. So unfortunately, that perfect storm we know is affecting you folks up here in the wildland of the human face. Um, our best advice is there is no silver bullet. And I applaud all of these efforts because those are going to help repair the market and reduce the risk. We're in the risk business, let's face it. So everything we can do from personal level, built environment mitigation, and then community mitigation on top of that is going to help you with your insurance. That said, you're going to have to shop more for it. That's a reality of where we're at. Especially many of you are in that high net worth insurance market. Some of those insurers are limiting their capacity. And I'm going out of Colorado, not yet. In California, we're seeing that in some cases. Some of that is due to insurance companies not being able to rate for the risk. Um, insurance companies don't like uncertainty, <laughs> both in catastrophe risk and how they're able to rate that risk and pay those claims. So um, what I would say to all of you, the insurance companies do believe that if you put the odds in your favor to take the scientifically proven steps to protect your property, that's why the insurance companies are still here. Of course, it's not a one off For many of you, depending on your risk, it's not just defensible space. We think it's a system, systemic bundled approach that will include all those things you can do around your home from fire-resistant plants, as they discussed, to home hardening. So um, your insurance companies, as you well know, um, do have wildfire mitigation requirements in place. Um, but the best way you can keep the odds in your favor of getting and keeping affordable insurance is do that mitigation, work with these good, comprehensive community mitigation programs. Make sure your insurance company knows it. So when you're getting that notice in the mail that says you need to do A, B, C, D, E, you're doing that. Communicating with them. I talk to a lot of groups like this, and I'm like, afraid to talk to my insurance company because I'm going to lose my insurance if they know my risk. Well, guess what, folks? They know what your risk is. <laughs> with technology, with modeling, they understand that risk, but they don't always know what a great community mitigation program that you had in place. You had on site inspections, you're doing that mitigation. So that's going to help you, and at the same time, you are going to have to shop more for it. If you're not getting insurance with the insurer that you've had for 20 years, you may have to shop A, B, C, and D, especially to spend, uh, depending on your risk, slow, all of those things do impact that decision making when it comes to keeping that insurance. So um, that's my best advice. And certainly, um, I hope, I know that's not a panacea, but it's going to take all of these efforts working together. Carol, the, the Denver Post, as we were talking about just before today's panel discussion, they had an article recently, and we may have more information from our legislators about this issue as well, recently had an article that talked about the Colorado legislature's effort to create a last resort property insurance plan. And it raised for me a, a, a broader question, one, any thoughts you have on that, but two, what does the insurance industry see on the horizon, and are there any creative or innovative approaches you're taking in line of those very issues that we just We strongly believe, as we look at insurance solutions, that again, we need to also repair the market. Taking mitigation steps. In hurricane from areas like Florida, we've been able to reduce the risk with scientifically proven steps to address that. We're doing the same. Um, we built a big lab down in South Carolina a number of years ago, and we create ember fires with the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. We burn stuff down. We create hailstorms in the lab. We create hurricanes. So those are all helping us. We're not just asking you to do mitigation or the communities to adopt what we think are the scientifically proven steps to reduce risk. We are actually, through the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, looking at ways that we can do better with mitigation. So when you ask me, what does the insurance industry expect, uh, expect for mitigation, both from the community program and you as homeowners? We have developed something called Wildfire Your Home, which is similar to uh, what they uh, call a program here in Evergreen and Jefferson County. Um, but we'll be seeing this rolling out in Colorado where you will actually be able to go online or through your mitigation program and working with the fire department it's another tool in a designation program where the insurance companies will recognize the work that you're doing on your home. Um, and uh, it has a number of layers. There's wildfire 
prepared at home, and that's the basic stuff you can do around your home. We think five feet of impeccable space around your home goes a long way to putting the odds in your favor. And wildfire prepared home plus, which will include some home hardening. These are things that the insurance industry, I'm really excited because it's what our expectations are. And then to Leslie's um, question about legislative solutions with our, our good legislators here who we work closely with. Um, we try to be at the table with every piece of legislation, as Senator Cutter well knows, um, as we're looking at who we code for. Um, we testified in support of Senator Cutter's bill, very much in support of good building codes like you had for Jefferson County. The other piece of legislation you're going to start hearing about is what we call a fair plan. Fair access to insurance requirements, because we love acronyms in the insurance industry. Uh, and it's a state fund of last resort. And um, these are funds that we have across the country, and they are not, as I said, a panacea. They are for people who cannot get insurance. It is the insurance that you don't want to have, but that you have to have. If you've been declined from, say, three insurance companies, the state will have a program that will, you will be able to get insurance from. Um, in California, they joke, yes, we'll insure your meth house. So uh, this is for people that are in high-risk areas, and this is a product for them to be able to get that insurance, keep their mortgage. It was introduced, it's um, House Bill 1288. It was introduced on Thursday. The primary sponsors are the Speaker of the House, Julian McCluskey, and also uh, Representative Mable and um, Dylan Roberts uh, as well. So anyway, you will hear more about this, and I know you're running out of time, complex thing, the stakes are really, really high. We need to get it right. A lot of you are well educated. You know what's happening in Florida with their fair plan. We cannot have the same type of fair plan in Colorado. So we're working closely with the speaker, the sponsors, the division of insurance to try to get this right and offer you that really need insurance, can't get it anywhere else, a temporary solution to get that insurance. Great, Carol, thank you so much. It's a great so overview. It's, all all it. it. no, it's, it's really important, and I know it matters to many of us in the audience as well. I just want to reinforce something you mentioned about our state legislators. We wouldn't be able to do the work that we're doing on the county level without the support of our representatives, Story, Tom, and Senator Cutter. In fact, both Representative Story and uh, Senator uh, Cutter, Representative Story and Senator Cutter serve on the Wildfire Matters Committee. So you can bet that Jeffco is at the table representing you when that committee is thinking about legislation. And also that committee often works with the Colorado Fire Commission, too, and will support bills moving forward. They will hold us accountable, they ask great questions, and of course, Representative Tome brings firefighting experience. So we all care very deeply um, about these issues. So Commissioner Kerr, Commissioner Kathar, and I are very fortunate to have a strong working relationship as well with them. Next, we want to get to your questions, and then we're going to set aside about 10, 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, a little bit more, we got the time, and we can move through those questions at a fairly good clip. I know we've got a great turnout today. We'll make sure, and if I forget, just tell, just throw it on my way, uh, or remind me, we want to make sure that you have the contact information from all of the panelists. The other thing that I want to point out is that we have a lot of expertise in the audience as well. I see some of our firefighters from Elk Creek, from West Metro. You have your canyon here. I thought I might have seen your canyon as well. Thank you for being here. And uh, we also have the Jefferson Conservation District. Uh, Garrett Stevens is with us, who also serves, and we have another representative as well. So thank you all for being here. Any other fire rescue agencies I missed? <laughs> Terrific. We really have great partnership. So, four questions. We ask that you would let us know first to whom you're directing your question. Uh, share with us your name. Let us know if you're a resident. And we'll start there and work to project. And I'll repeat your question if we need to for the audience. We'll go right here. Tell us your name and who you'd like your question to go to. My name is Kit Darrell. And my question is for Mr. Montoya. I'm sorry I didn't get your first name. Avell. It's pronounced Avell. Avell. Avell, okay. Um, many residents, including those of us who live out uh, Buffalo Park Road, Hangin Ranch, Arapahoe Estates, have done pretty much all we can do to mitigate our properties. Uh, my husband and I have uh, wrapped our house with hardy board and taken down lots of trees. We have a slash removal program in our neighborhood, and I see many of the neighbors here. 
Here's my question. How can the county keep the roadways free of congestion and parking, especially when the fire danger is high? We've had to evacuate twice in the last few years, and it's been a mess. So how can we keep the roadways free of congestion and parking? So the question is, how can we keep the roadways free of congestion and parking? When the fire danger. When the fire danger is high. Thanks so much, Kit, for that question. I know it's top of mind. And I'm going to go to our under sheriff, Scott Eddy, as well, to talk about that. But Bill, first, is there anything you'd like to add? And of course, Sheriff uh, Marinelli, if you have thoughts, too. Uh, one of the things that we do want to look at is uh, trees or shrubs or growth within the right of way for county roads to see if we can remove some of those obstacles so that if there is parking or congestion, it leaves more room for people to be able to uh, leave their property or the area. Now, th that's an expensive endeavor. Um, even though we may survey an area and target it as a priority, there's a couple things we'll have to do. We have to survey the land to make sure that we would not be disrupting or removing any of the, the vegetation on private property. Uh, number two, uh, we would have to pay for the removal and then hauling of that material. And, and just so you know, surveys on, on that kind of scale uh, could be $50,000 to $100,000 just to do the survey. And then we would have to uh, bid out the work uh, to a third party to do the removal. So those types of things are very expensive. We would be seeking grant funds. But as you know, we have to balance that as well with some of our timber caps. So uh, once we establish priorities, then we can uh, continue to discuss how about going, uh, going about removing those uh, trees or shrubs. I'm going to have your sheriff Eddie come on over, and while he's walking over, as Adele was saying, grants for wildfire mitigation and more count against our timber cap. So if we go above that timber cap, those dollars we get from grants have to be taken somewhere else in the budget. Uh, good morning. Thanks for everybody being here. I know a lot of what your concern is, is are we going to be able to get folks out of that neighborhood and then also equipment and fire trucks and police into that neighborhood. And I guarantee you if we have that kind of issue where we have uh, cars who are clogging the road whatsoever, we have agreements with tow companies. They will send in a fleet of uh, vehicles at our request. We will snatch those cars, we will move them over to, uh, let, let's say, a school somewhere outside of the way, one of the RTD lots. Uh, also, even going beyond that, if there was a vehicle that was just abandoned in that roadway that was going to block those kind of things, I will offer ahead my folks to just push it off the road. We will get it out of the way one way or another. You know, if I can call Road Bridge or bring a top truck, push it out of the way. But we are going to ensure that the fire trucks can get in, the police can get in, the residents can get out. We'll do everything we can. That's, that's in our expertise. We'll make sure that happens. Yes? Think are you consider, considered um, uh, non permanent no parking signs? So when the fire danger is high, there's no parking in this area? <coughs> that kind of thing. We have been working with uh, uh, the county, and uh, just very recently, I know our, our uh, commander who was up here in the Mountain Precinct, he's been checking into that. And uh, look and see what those are feasible in those areas. I'm going to go ahead and uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tom, you had some thoughts on that too. And we'll get to some more questions. Just uh, as it relates to open space parks in particular, uh, all of the three sisters in El Meadow. Um, first off, we are doing improvements to both trailheads at both parks, uh, expanding parking there and so we can get people uh, off of parking on the road. Uh, Obviously, is a much safer situation. Uh, I also want to mention that we have now have 29 open space rangers. All of those rangers are on JeffCom, the same communication that all the fire and rescue and sheriff's office and law enforcement uses. Uh, as soon as there is any kind of pre-evacuation um, notice, our rangers are closing down parks and clearing them out and getting folks out of there um, so that they won't. Um, be any kind of uh, disruption to your evacuation efforts. So uh, know that there's a lot of coordination between law enforcement, fire rescue, and Jeff and Space Rangers. And I'd also say our first responders are always on top of cutting edge information regarding new strategies and solutions regarding evacuation routes. Chief Weegee and I were talking just a little bit earlier. A number of folks who were in the room were at that day long evacuation 
class that Bina held just recently. So I'm going to work my way across here. I'm going to just check with our elected officials. Are you okay if we go until 10 and then we go to county and state updates? I will do that. I'll just turn it over to Andy, okay, because we've got a lot of questions. Susan. Um, I'm going to direct my question to Jess mostly. Carol is going to be interested. Um, this is not my first rodeo. My husband and I owned a home in Grand County. Um, we own the road coming off of Upper Bear. We pay taxes on it. Some new homeowners just moved in, and I have had a meeting at my house with Jess trying to work this problem out. Um, we had XL come in, cut the wood around the poles, change out poles, and they left the wood. Uh, this family has not found it necessary to move this wood, which would block 13 homes from an escape if we have a fire. So Susan, let me just, just because we have so many hands up, is the question, what do we do in terms of collaborating with our neighbors yes. to remove that threat? And I also see this huge poster board in front, thank you for bringing that, regarding mastication and also mitigation efforts when we have those uh, piles of wood as well. Sometimes they're organized for good and more. But Jess, can you address a couple of those issues just briefly? So one of the things that I want to clarify or make known to, especially to Evergreen residents, this was also true in Elk Creek and in the Canyon, is that our entire communities through our community wildfire protection plans were broken into plan units. So in Evergreen Fires District, we have 26 plan units, and almost every single one of those plan units has a volunteer community ambassador. Now, what these ambassadors role is within the community is to help get information into these neighborhoods and to help spread our message and our efforts on the mitigation front into the communities. So one of the things that I strongly encourage, and it's available on our website where you can search and find what your community wildfire protection implementation plan unit is, is to go there, find out, and look to see who your ambassador is working with our ambassadors within the community. Every, every neighborhood, every plan unit within Evergreen's district has unique situations, demographics, and unique concerns and problems for tackling our mitigation issues. So we work directly with our ambassadors in order to get the work done within the communities. And it's also a means for us to go through and motivate the communities because truly, we are in this together, and so we have to get our neighbors involved. We have to do this together because, you know, and I often get that where, you know, people are asking, I've done all of my work, but what about my neighbor? Well, if that's the case, first we're going to make sure you've done all your work because to a certain degree, a lot of folks think they've done everything, but maybe they've still got some stuff they can do. But then, too, we do look to, you know, explain the situation and explain what is defensible space? What is home parking? There's a lot of misinformation out there. And the reality is, is that what we do for defensible space is about the science behind changing fire behavior as it moves into our neighborhoods and into our properties. Um, I, often, I always make this analogy is that, you know, it's no different than we know these fires are coming just like we know hurricanes are coming. We cannot change a Category 5 hurricane down to a Category 2, but we can build out our home environment to withstand that Category 5, right? So that's what we do through defensible space and home hardening, is we are building out our home environment zone to withstand the onslaught of the inevitable fires that we know happen in a forest that we built our houses in that we know is designed to burn. I think so. Thank you. I think that collaborative piece that you talk about is so important, and I think you see it demonstrated here. Tom, just briefly, because I want to get to some other questions we have. We'll get to those of you in the back as well. Briefly, could you touch on the concerns that we hear from constituents about once mitigation is done and the forest floor is still, or mastication is done up those steep banks, and we know fire travels a lot quicker up those steep banks, how do we remove that biomass? Does it create more fire threat to have that biomass on the ground? Just quickly, can coming. I show the picture so that people know what mastication is? Um, I'm not sure. Just very, yes. Yeah, so 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 please go ahead and answer. While this is taking it. it yeah. 
Flying J, this is what's left behind after they do the removal of the tree. Oh, sorry. It's almost the same upside down now. I know. It kind of does look the same, sort of a post apocalyptic nightmare. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's find out how we deal with it. Let me, let me address this. I mean, we just had a meeting this week with our partners at the Jefferson Conservation District talking about um, the ongoing challenge of once we do mitigation on public property or private land, what do we, how, how do we deal with fuels that, that are harvested from that property? It's a huge problem to figure out how we recycle that biomass and reuse it. So, we, we want to get the large material off-site to the best of our ability, and the smaller material we want to turn up in a, as fine a way as we can. And, and by the way, the standard is, is about four inches of depth of, 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 of uh, masticated material that you saw the picture of. In some cases, and some other projects, it's a greater depth, it's not turned up as finely. It is beneficial in that it stabilizes the soil, provides a seedbed, and that fuel is on the ground. On the ground fuel isn't as, as significant as fuel that's up in the air that allows fire to travel more rapidly. I'm going to go here next, just to, like, I'm going to keep us moving. You had your hand up as yes, well. Thank you. Please My name ahead. is Adrian Hannigan, and uh, I'm from Lakewood, Colorado. And uh, my question is for the um, insurance person or for you guys. Is there a software package where I could enter in my address and have a rough idea of what my fire risk is? And I've been reading this and I realize there are things that I've done that are not so good. So Thank I just wanted to ask. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. So the question is is there a website we can go to? Tap in our address and find out what our wildfire risk is. Carol, Jess, if you want to take that one. I can also touch on yours just really quick. Um, so the program I talked about, Wildfire Prepared Home, yeah. will have that ability. Um, it will put in your address and then it will tell you the things you need to do around the property and how to qualify for it. But the way the program works the best is in keeping with community programs. Um, to educate homeowners to come out, do the inspections. There will be an on-site inspection required once you put your address in there. So your insurance company can talk to you about your insurability and your risk. Now, working with your community program, I think, is the best way to really assess that risk and learn what you need to do and address on your property. Um, so, can you repeat what that was? So, so we don't have any call letters yet. Okay. So what I'm saying is that's why we probably turn it over to Jess. Is um, the best advice right now is working with your community program to find out your risk on your individual property. Yes, and so in addition to that, you can go to the Colorado State Forest Service. They have wildfire risk maps that you can look up through their programs. That is the home ignition zone guidelines, the big pamphlet that was on the back table. Those are the guidelines that we as fire districts utilize in our recommendations as well as obvious experience, but um, those Colorado State Forest Service guidelines are the recommendations that we'll follow and there are risk assessments through their website as well. Great, I'm gonna to go to some of the hands that I see up in the back and along the wall. Go ahead, Hi, I'm
prior to some of the hazards that we are very concerned about today in, in a more prominent way, um, the roadways didn't necessarily meet current standards. And um, in a lot of cases, those standards have changed over time. So we do find on occasion that we'll have a parcel that's zoned a certain way, maybe for higher density housing, as you mentioned, you know, 20 to 40 units. And in some cases, the, the road right away has different ownership. So actually, the county may own some of that roadway, whereas sections of it may actually be easements on private property or uh, historical roadways that have been there that cross um, a property in some manner whether that was because of mining or in other circumstances. So when an applicant comes in, we examine all of those different scenarios and facts, and we try to, to figure out what the best path forward is. So we ask the applicant to meet with the community to get some feedback. We ask them to meet with the local fire district to see if, in fact, they can get their uh, apparatus to that facility, uh, and if not, what needs to be done. And uh, a lot of times we are stuck in that discussion for a little while before we figure out the best way forward. Uh, in some cases, those might be administrative permits where there's really strict criteria in regard to what needs to be met for primary and secondary access. Uh, but then also we work with the fire district to learn that if we can't meet all of the access requirements, are there other standards we could put in place like um, you know, sprinkler systems or cisterns, uh, things of that nature. So it's a challenging situation, and we try to work through each unique circumstance. Yeah, and one of the things we're also looking at is more consistency across the state. And I know Senator Cutter will talk more about the minimum when we code for a bill, because our work in Jeffco is only as good as our neighbors, our surrounding counties. Let's see if we can work in one or two more quick questions. We'll be here after the town hall. You've been waiting patiently. Please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Specifically, absentee owner, short term rentals. They have the property, they can put as far away as Hawaii. Yes. And there's no provision in Jetco to do anything about that and correct that. They have in Golden and Denver, you have to you have to live on the property, you have a portion of your properties. You've got all these things saying yes. Prevention is only as effective as you name it. Right, and that's right. neighbors that are in this state. You know? Or who may not understand the high you wildfire know, risk. Thank you. Great question. The question was about building <laughs> and And maybe thank you very much for that question. And then I'll talk more if you would share with us about what the county is doing in this area and next steps. Thank you. Yeah, short term rentals is a big topic in Jetco and within our cities and across the region. Uh, we are examining updating our regulations. That question has been posed, you know, should we only allow short-term rentals if there is an owner that's occupying the structure as well? Should we change the lot size requirements to not be greater than an acre? And maybe in some cases it's suitable to be in a multifamily situation in, in other areas as well. And the, the big question though is response. If there is a concern, whether that's somebody who's smoking outside and they're not supposed to, or there's an unattended fire, uh, or a party, we hear a lot of things about parties at short-term rentals. How can they contact somebody that can do something about it quickly? And, and we're examining whether or not we can hire a third party that's paid for through the short-term rental fees to help administer that kind of program. Where if the property owner is not available or their representative to respond to the complaint, we have a hotline that you can call either in lieu of or in, in addition to so that we can um, help out any way we can. In a lot of cases, um, you know, calling the sheriff um, when there's disruptive behavior could be one mechanism, um, but making codes that are predictable and that safeguard the community is what we're hoping to do in the next few months. We're coming up right at 10 o'clock, and we want to make sure we get our county and state updates in. Before, uh, we'll see if we have one more quick question, but before we do that, let me first ask, is David Clark here with, Senate, with uh, Congresswoman Patterson's office? Wonderful. David, can you come on up real quick? There's a lot of federal grant dollars that we're looking at, and also we work very closely with Congressman Nagus. Uh, he covered this area as part of his efforts. Now it's Senator, uh, Congresswoman Patterson. Thank you so much for your patience with me. Briefly, David, talk to us about what's happening at the federal level 
and what Congress Woman Pedersen is focused on, and what it means for residents of the rural regions wildfires briefly. Sure, uh, I guess that my name's David. Um, I know Congresswoman Pedersen is working on the financial services committee. Yeah. Um, she is on the subcommittee of housing and insurance, and she's definitely, uh, this is an issue that she's talking about. I really appreciate the opportunity to hear concerns. I mean, we are also looking at any federal grants um, around wildfire mitigation. Great. Well, we're grateful you're here this morning, and all our best members of the and thank you. Um, we'll do one more question. Let me go here. I know you've had me go all over. You've been patient. We'll be here afterwards if you'd like to talk to us. And I'm going to have the panelists in a second share all your contact information. Briefly, could you share in the flash share your own question and share your name with us, please? Sure. Uh, Tim Berg. Um, I would just like to say thank you to uh, Senator Cutter. Uh, she came out on the weekend. She did a newscast with me in my neighborhood. She did it on her own time. Very short notice. Um, Senator Story, same thing. She's mm -hmm. also talked to me personally. Uh, they're both superstars. <coughs> um, I would just ask everybody to please put politics aside. We have to come together as a state, as a county, as a people. We have to not think about politics. And my question is how do I get one of these events in my neighborhood? <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. We love to put one together for you, seriously. Let me just mention one quick thing that uh, Tom shared with me, and that's the Jeffco non-emergency number. We were talking a little bit earlier about short-term rentals and other issues. That number is 303-277-0211. Quickly, um, panelists, would you share your contact information, your email, if you would, with everyone in the audience? I'll start with Jess. We want to thank you so much for your engagement, for being here, for your great questions. If you have any follow-up issues for the Board of County Commissioners, you can email us at commish, C-O-M-M-I-S-H, at jeffco.us. With that, I'm going to invite our elected officials to come on up. And let me also introduce Hal Green, who is our Emergency Management Director as well. Like 30 seconds? Uh, I just wanted to... You may have to take a picture, come up with your uh, camera, but let's get through this first. All right, let's get through this first and then we can come on up. We'll take care of you, don't worry. Hey everybody, I just wanted to follow up really quick, not only with the phone number, but uh, Jeffcom 911, they're, they're our 911 service. They're not here today, but one thing I did want to talk about, they did just release the Jeffcom 911 app that does have non-emergency reporting as well. It also has an ability to get your uh, get yourself registered for the lookout alert system. And it also has uh, mapping capabilities to show you who your fire districts are, who your law enforcement agencies are. And that's brand new. So I wanted to support our partners and let y'all know about that app as well. It's, uh, it's just Jeffcom 911. So if you go to your, your app store, um, you can download that. You'll see their little logo. And again, that's not mine, but I wanted to, to make sure that we supported our partners as well. Thanks so much, Al. Yeah. Please join me giving our panelists amazing insight. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn it over to Senator Cutter, who will lead us all with updates and the lots going on in the legislature on this issue, too. Thank you, Commissioner Dahlkemper. Um, first of all, it's just so wonderful to see so many community members. It's great to, to have you all out here today for this really important topic. And thanks to Commissioner Dahlkemper for and all of our speakers, our panelists, for um, organizing and being here today to, to share their knowledge. Um, I feel really fortunate to work with all of these uh, wonderful people. It, there's no perfect solution to any of the problems that we're talking about, but um, I'm really confident that everyone is doing their best to work together and, and create the best environment possible, given our lack of resources and the complexity of the, uh, the wildfire issue in the state. 
Um, I am your state senator. I have been, um, I was your representative and switched to being in Senate because of redistricting um, just this term. But for the entire time I've served on the Wildfire Matters Interim Committee, so it's been a really important issue to me. Um, I, I'm on Transportation and Energy, Health and Human Services, and I also sit on the Forest Health Advisory Council. So I, I, for this work in particular, I do come at it from both perspectives. I, I care deeply about climate change and the environment, and I also care deeply about protecting our homes and our, our properties and our um, you know, economy, <laughs> recreational opportunities, and um, just the forest and the way of life we all love and enjoy here in Colorado. Um, this year, I've been focusing a lot on um, climate change, environmental issues, mental and behavioral health, and also some consumer protection things. But in the wildfire space, I, um, I have been working on, let's see, a workforce bill, because there's so many different problems, right? We can put a lot of resources to this, but if we don't have people um, able to carry out the work, then that's a problem. I'm sure some of our fire professionals here can attest to the fact that they can always use more hands. And so we, um, we've created a workforce bill that's moving through the system right now, and uh, we hope to have that funded. It'll create some programs and funding for, for these programs in uh, schools throughout the state. We have been working on, I've been working on an investigations bill so that we can actually um, support our, our firefighters in really determining the cause of fires, give them the resources they need to determine the cause of these fires so we um, have just have more data and more information to, to um, fight them better, mitigate against them. Um, I, I'm going to let uh, Rob Stray talk about this one, but we've been working on a uh, nursery um, tree nursery bill also that's really exciting, but she, uh, she has all the details on that. She's been leading the charge. And um, as Commissioner Dahlkemper mentioned, we have been working really, really hard for months on a wildland urban interface code board. There is no consistent code throughout the state. And that is a problem. We're a local control state, so there's lots of um, parties to talk to and, and uh, you know, negotiations and, and trying to make this as easy as possible for folks. Some people aren't uh, a fan of having a consistent code board, but what I, our code, this board will determine and develop um, the code. But what I'll tell you is uh, we've been listening very, very closely to the, the people on the ground, the fire professionals, the experts, uh, insurance, thank you uh, to Carol for the support on this one, to all of the people we can um, that work in this space all the time. And it's really, really important that we come together and create some consistency and also the, uh, the Fire Commission, and uh, Commissioner Dahlkemper has been amazing. Um, we have to create some consistency. You all know fire knows no boundaries. Your neighbor's house catches on fire, your house isn't safe. And that doesn't just extend to individual properties, of course, that goes to counties, uh, you know, all throughout the state. We all experience um, the smoke, the impacts of smoke. I remember during COVID, the only thing we could do was go outside, and we could go outside. <laughs> we went up to Steamboat Springs and with our family, and we stayed in the town home the whole time, the kind of the whole time. So there's so many impacts of wildfire. It is a statewide problem, and so this code board is, as I said, has been in the works for a while. It'll create a board of, um, I believe, we're 21 people, very robust, a very robust board. But all of these people come from different backgrounds, different parts of the state. They they wear different hats and representing. Um, there are people with this issue, and I think that's really important that we have all the voices at the table. As um, someone was saying earlier, it's a statewide concern. It, it, like, it takes all of us to work together. I mean, I think a few people have said that. It takes all of us to work together to solve this. So we're gathering all that perspectives. They will um, develop a code, and there, there really isn't a great way of measuring risk right now. There's all kinds of different measures, um, but they're going to look at all the different um, metrics, the, the plans that are in place, the state forest service definitions, and they're going to uh, come up with some definitions of what high risk areas really are, what that means. And then this board will be charged with reviewing them every three years. And if they need to be updated, they will be updated. So um, that's just pretty high level on it, but I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to make a huge impact. I will I will share that, um, Sheriff Marinelli just shared a story with me that in um, the Golden Gate Canyon fire, I think that was just last week, wasn't it? Um, yeah, weird wildfire season springing up in <laughs> like February, March, and April now. Um, but in that fire, her deputies got to the scene and were 100% sure that this house was not going to make it. And um, 
and you know they were certain that it was going to go. But it was so well mitigated that the house survived, and it was pretty miraculous. And I think that's what we see. Um, I, you know, I've seen multiple videos and demonstrations, and when a home is fully hardened or built in the first place with the proper materials, which is what we're going after with this code board, then there is really such a greater chance that that home, are we getting head nods from the, the fire folks back there, that there's a much greater chance that that home will survive. If that home survives, they're not going to catch fire and spread fire to the next home down the line. It's a, it's a um, really important thing. So I'm excited to get that passed. I'm excited about all the work that we're doing together in the wildfire space. I'll mention too that um, we, the state has found money to fund another Firehawk helicopter. So we're uh, really doing all we can and it is quite a, a big focus at the state level. But um, yeah, so I, I appreciate the support and appreciate having you all out here today to hear about these important topics and I'll put my information on the board too. You can reach out to me anytime. I'm happy to chat with you and, and really delightful to see you all here today. So thank you. And I will turn it over to Representative Story. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. This is a great turnout and I appreciate you giving us some of your valuable time for this really important topic. And I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Dahl Kemper for all of her work in setting this up, as well as the panelists to provide so much great information today. I'm Tammy Story. I'm the state representative for this area. Uh, my district includes the foothills of Jeffco south of I-70, and then a small portion of Littleton around the Chatfield High School articulation area. Um, I have been a legislator since 2018, and I have served on the Wildfire Matters Review Committee, working on those issues during the interim. And I currently serve on the um, Behavioral Health and um, Behavior Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee, as well as Ag, Water, and Natural Resources Committee. And I'm the chair of Capital Development Committee, which we is a year-round committee, and we work on all the capital and construction needs of all of our state buildings. Um, like the Capitol, Department of Corrections, all of our institutions in higher ed, the Republic, and all of our state parks. Um, and so this issue is of critical importance, as you all know. I've lived here for about 37 years in the um, foothills of the Conifer Evergreen area. Um, I have all of the many challenges that many of you have in terms of mitigating our properties that are so important. Um, I carried a bill last year to uh, provide more financial support for our local volunteer fire departments across the state. 85% of our firefighters are volunteers in Colorado, in case you didn't know. 85% of them. And that's hugely significant. They're all volunteer fire departments up here in our foothills. And these people put their lives on the line all the time to protect our properties and our lives to ensure that we get out. And um, I just want to have an opportunity to give them a hand. Many of them are in the The bill that I carried, this one, was to provide more financial resources for those volunteer firefighters for the equipment that they need, their, their personal protective equipment, their boots, their hats, their pants, their gloves, their jackets, their helmets, all of that, because um, in many cases they are putting the bill themselves to pay for all of that equipment. Um, also carried a bill last year to um, build out a much more robust and wildfire, um, sorry, wildfire Awareness Month in May. It's a national program, and so it's a collaboration between the Colorado State Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, and the Colorado Department of Fire Prevention and Control. And so they have been working on this for about a year now, and we'll be rolling it out um, here in just a short time for the month of May. Um, but for those of you that are part of a homeowners association in particular, or a, um, a group similar to that, you will be able to access some of those materials to be able to share within your communities. Um, and um, I think they've, they've put together a really good program, and I'm looking forward 
to you. Um, seeing that all roll out for the month of May. I'm also working on a bill this year carrying it on the um, tree nursery. Colorado State Forest Service has a tree nursery up on the Colorado State University um, campus, and it provides the seedlings for um, wildfire restoration. We have the big fires, and we need to restore those areas. Those seedlings are going to those areas, and it's also for our um, watershed uh, protection so that we can um, try and help prevent that erosion. So it's really important, you know, we've had some pretty significant fires in the last couple of, not in the recent year, but um, a couple of years ago, and we know that we will have another big major fire season sometime, we keep hoping that it doesn't happen anytime soon, but we know it will, and um, this tree nursery is, is just critical to um, restoring those areas after we do have a fire. I'm happy to take any questions at some point if we have time for that. I'll put my contact information on the board as well. And thanks so much again for being here. Good morning. Thank you for all, all for being here today. Uh, I'm Representative Leila Tatone. Uh, I'm kind of new to the mountain areas of Jefferson County uh, after redistricting last year. Uh, here, I took over all the mountainous area north of I-70 in Jefferson County. Uh, I also represent uh, the northern part of Arvada, all the way out to Sheridan, and then Golden as well. So, uh, I've been in the legislature, this is my fifth year. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Dahlkepper mentioned, I used to be a volunteer firefighter uh, back in New York, so I had seven years of experience doing that. Uh, so I do bring a little bit of knowledge in that respect to uh, the things that we do. So I, I serve on the Agriculture, uh, Water, and Natural Resources Committee. This is a committee that gets a new name every two years, so it's like, <laughs> what is it called this year? Uh, and I also serve on the Health and Insurance Committee. I'm also the Vice Chair of the Joint Technology Committee, and we alternate Chair, Vice Chair. We do all the IT systems uh, and capital projects in IT for the state. Uh, I kind of go through a lot of different uh, topics with the work that I do. I don't really focus on a lot of uh, specific things, but uh, this year we had a bill for uh, resiliency in commercial buildings. It's a program called CPACE, and uh, that was signed by the governor a few weeks ago. That gives uh, commercial uh, property owners the ability to build resiliency into their buildings. And uh, we added some more provisions and made it easier for them to get the funding for that. Uh, another bill that's uh, very close to the governor's desk right now is Right to Repair. This is for agricultural equipment, so uh, giving farmers the ability to fix their equipment. Uh, also, I, we have a bill coming up pretty soon in the House floor. It's a HOA and Metro District Task Force bill. So there's been a lot of issues in uh, metro districts and HOAs, and uh, this bill is going to convene a task force for both of those topics separately and talk about a lot of the issues that are happening, and really just try to get some ideas in a report that we can use that information to come up with new bills in the following session to uh, mitigate some of those issues that people are having. Uh, I also have a teacher externship bill, so an externship is uh, when you do work outside of your normal work, so a teacher will work in a local business to learn about the jobs and the uh, career opportunities that are available uh, for students, and they will bring that information back to the classroom. They'll be able to uh, make some lesson plans and get some kids interested in the local jobs that we have here to create a more uh, viable pipeline for the, uh, the jobs are going to be available right here. We have a lot of high-tech jobs in Jefferson County that's uh, supposed to help get some of those jobs filled. Uh, I have another bill on healthcare transparency, uh, just to make sure that if you're going to a hospital and you're expecting to get a certain kind of service there that you would expect a hospital to provide, uh, sometimes they don't provide that. And it's a transparency bill to make sure that you're not going to be surprised to, to find out, once you get there, that they don't do that. And that's uh, an important thing for our healthcare system. 
Another bill that uh, is coming up uh, pretty soon is uh, advancing clean hydrogen. So we're working to try to bolster our uh, footprint in the hydrogen space here. So uh, there's a consortium of states that the federal government is uh, putting some money into to create this hydrogen hub. And uh, this is going to bring down a lot of federal money and incentivize some of the uh, power generation and other utilities to produce hydrogen in the cleanest ways possible. And hydrogen can be used as a fuel source. You can actually store energy into hydrogen by producing hydrogen and using it later to produce energy when we are not, when the sun's not out or when the wind is not blowing. And uh, Senator Cutter is on that bill with me as well. Uh, so we're just getting started with that. There's going to be some tax credits and some uh, infrastructure on that. Uh, I have a bill coming up pretty soon in the House that will remove the provisions of Senate Bill 152 from 2008, I believe it was, and 2010. And so what Senate Bill 152 did was it said, if you want to put broadband in your community and you're a city or a county, you have to get a vote of the people to remove the provision to prevent you from doing it before you can do it. That's a big hassle. And I'm sure a lot of folks here, uh, you know, have dealt with, you know, shoddy broadband. Uh, and we have a lot of money coming from the federal government right now, and we want to make sure we're able to use. So we're removing that provision of having to have a vote, so that way the local governments can get money from the federal government and start installing this really critical infrastructure that we need. This is something I've been trying to do for several years, and now that we have this big pot of money coming down, uh, this has uh, really got everybody excited about removing this provision so we can get this stuff in. Uh, another couple things I'm working on, uh, auto theft prevention. So uh, we've got some money in the budget this year to help uh, investigate auto theft and uh, all the different things going on uh, with that to try to get ahead of these gangs and, and organized crime, trying to steal everybody's cars. So we're going to make sure that we have the ability to track them down and prosecute them uh, to keep our cars and our property safe. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's about it on my bills. Uh, but I also, uh, just looking to make sure that we're having really good conversations and having the ability to, to meet with me. I do a beer and a coffee every month. Uh, I also do another town hall with our Arvada that's next week. That's up at the, I think it's at Indian Hills Golf Course this, this month. We usually do it at the Stanley Lake Library. Uh, but if you have any questions or anything that you want to contact me about, I'm always uh, happy to, to chat with you about anything. I, I don't represent this area, uh, but I represent the northern part of Jefferson County. So uh, always, if you can't reach somebody else, you can always try me as well. So uh, thank you so much for being here. This has been a, this is a great turnout. We really appreciate you having interest in uh, the things that we're doing in the state. And uh, please keep in touch. So I'll hand it over to uh, Senator Kirk. Your contact information, too. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'm Commissioner Andy Kerr. I represent District 2, which is the, the center district in, in Jefferson County, and including uh, parts of uh, Evergreen. And uh, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, this, is, this is great. Uh, between all of us, uh, we have done town halls uh, over the years, and this is, uh, we've, we've been missing people the, the, the last three years. Uh, our town halls, when we have done them in person, have not turned out like this. So uh, it's, it's great to see everyone in, in so interested in these important topics. Uh, just a couple of things, and I don't know if you saw Kevin Morse, who just snuck out, and I think he actually, uh, he was sitting right there, but he just snuck out. Uh, he's the chair of our sustainability commission that the uh, commissioners uh, appointed, and the, the commissioners unanimously uh, approved our climate action plan for Jefferson County. So um, regardless of where we are on exactly how we're doing fire mitigation and everything else, I think we can all agree that uh, taking action in, in solving our climate issues is, is uh, top 
uh, uh, top shelf stuff we need to focus on, and, and Kevin is, is the chair of that, and, and we are focused on that. Um, I also want to mention, you've probably heard in the news, that uh, during COVID, uh, the federal government did extend SNAP benefits, that Supplemental Nutrition Assistant Plan uh, benefits, um, and those benefits are ending. Either they have ended or they're, they're at least declining. Uh, for many people who depend on them for their food security, uh, including our, our neighbors right here in Jefferson County, our Health and Human Services folks have been working. Oh, good, Kevin, you didn't leave. I start talking about you. <laughs> um, so our Health and Human Services uh, folks have been working literally overtime um, to make to reach out to folks who are having their SNAP benefits go down, who are going to be uh, more food insecure tomorrow than they were yesterday. Now the the commissioners. Uh, we, we did have some of our ARPA money left from the federal government. We did put uh, a little over a million, I think it was about $1.3 million into our uh, food system, our emergency food system, uh, and our partners uh, throughout uh, Jefferson County. Uh, but the, those, our food pantries and the folks who work in this area are really going to need everyone's help over these next few months to help our folks transition who are, who are uh, having their uh, SNAP benefits uh, decrease. Uh, I also want to take this uh, moment to remind everyone there are donuts back there. Uh, if uh, they're not gone, I have to take them to a, a lacrosse team that's playing a couple of games today, and they might chase me all over the field to fight over the donuts, so uh, please take as many as, as you can. Um, I also want to introduce someone. We had a, a surprise guest today that I didn't know would be here, but we are very, very happy he's here in Jefferson County. And this is our brand new county manager, Joe Kirby. So Joe, could you give us a wave? Joe, Joe has worked in local government here in Colorado, uh, and uh, he most recently comes uh, from Benton County in, in Oregon. We're really pleased to, to uh, have him here. Uh, so glad he get Joe, all of our town halls we always have are this packed and, and with this much passion to them. So uh, we really hope to, to have more and, uh, and certainly uh, be coming by as much as possible. We also want to get him out into the community as much as possible. So uh, if you have, uh, you need to reach out to anyone up here, um, but we also want to get uh, Joe out into the community as much as possible. And uh, I know he's probably still unpacking boxes and everything in his house, uh, but it's, it's great to see him. Here. So, uh, with that, uh, we are at 1028. I don't want to uh, short anyone's um, questions with a, a minute and a half left. I know a number of us uh, will be able to stick around. Like I mentioned, I do need to head to a, a lacrosse game here pretty quickly, but we will try to uh, stick around and, and answer questions on an individual basis. Please come up, take pictures. And our next town hall date. June 4th. June 4th. We're playing June 4th right here. And again, thank you, Green uh, Fire uh, Rescue, for your hospitality. Thank you, everyone.